Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Pokana Limited's Q3 and 9-month FY24 earnings conference call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the call, please signal an operator by pressing star, then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Gavin Lisa from CDR India. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thank you, Ria. Good day, everyone, and a warm welcome to Pokorna Limited's Q3 and 9-month FY24 earnings conference call. On the call today, we have Mr. Paris Jain, the Chief Executive Officer at Pokorna Engineer Stone, and Mr. Vishwanathan Reddy, the CFO. Before we begin, I would like to mention that some of the statements made in today's discussions may be forward-looking in nature and may involve risks and uncertainties. I now invite Mr. Paris Jain to open proceedings of the call and share perspectives on performance and outlook. Over to you, Paris. Thank you, Gavin. Greetings and thank you all for joining us today. While you have the financial numbers for the quarter at your disposal, I'd like to share insights into the core services industry to provide context for our current financial and operational performance and the future. This quarter, we've seen stable margins compared to the last quarter with the improvements over the same quarter in FY23. This stability and improvement were, pri were driven primarily by innovative product design, a strategic mix of product thicknesses and favorable forex conditions. Our commitment to expanding our product range with more stylized collections and the adoption of new technologies is unwavering. This not only delivers great values, but also aligns with our long-term strategy and immediate operational adjustments to market shifts. We are actively pursuing initiatives to cut costs, boost efficiency, and optimize material use. Moreover, we are focused on developing alternatives that lower respirable crystalline silica content in the product meeting sustainability objectives and market demand. According to the latest National Kitchen and Bath Association of America report, kitchen and bath revenues in the U.S. for calendar 24 are expected to fall by approximately 3% year, year over year. New construction and remodeling expenditures are, are projected to decline by 4% and 2% respectively in 2024. Despite a recent increase, the supply of existing homes remain below a balanced market level, with expectations of continuation until mortgage rates approach around 5%. The demand for new homes remains strong, leading to a pred predicted price increase of 1% in 2024 and 3% in 2025. However, higher interest rates are causing difficulties for smaller builders, thus benefiting large home builders. Our industry, deeply influenced by the perception of quartz countertops as more of a luxury than a necessity, faces heightened vulnerability to economic shifts. The considerable fixed costs associated with producing quartz surfaces bring to the fore the importance of maintaining the sales momentum and managing our financial resources with prudence, especially during the market slowdown. To navigate this challenge, we've embarked on a strategy focused on regularly unveiling distinctive designs and expanding our reach with precision. This ensures we not only sustain our sales volume, but also safeguard our margins. In tandem with these efforts, we are working on diligently optimizing our capacity utilization to resonate more closely with market demand and our strategic growth ambitions. Initially, this focus on optimization may slightly compress our margins. However, this is a strategic choice aimed at fortifying our market positions over the long haul. We are confident that this strategy will not only bolster our competitive edge, but also significantly enhance shareholder value in medium to long term, underpinning our commitment to sustainable and strategic growth. This approach represents a deliberate and thoughtful progression from responding to immediate market pressure by maintaining sales and managing costs, to optimizing operations to better meet market demands, to ultimately repositioning our product offering towards more lucrative segments. Each step in this journey is designed to strengthen our market presence and ensure our long-term success. Looking forward, despite short to medium-term uncertainties, I remain optimistic about our prospects. Our flair for design, state-of-the-art manufacturing capabilities, steadfast customer relationships, and our expanding presence instill, me, instill in me a strong belief in our future success. 
we are not merely weathering the storm we are navigating it with precision ready to capitalize on the opportunities that lie ahead once again thank you for joining the call i am now open to answer any questions you might have thank you very much we will now begin the question and answer session anyone who wishes to ask questions may press star and 1 on the touchstone telephone if you wish to remove yourself from the question queue you may press star and 2 Also, we request participants to please limit the questions to two per participant. Should you have a follow-up question, we request you to rejoin the queue. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. To ask questions, please press star and one. The first question is from the line of Dixit Doshi from Whitestone Financial Advisors. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, couple of questions. Firstly, uh, so recent uh, during the last quarter, we have seen that uh, how the Australia has banned the product. So, are you seeing anything, uh, any talks or anything happening in the US as well? And uh, uh, my second question is uh, regarding the current uh, uh, problem in the Red Sea. Are we facing uh, the delay in the shipment and also on the cost of logistics side? Yeah, thank you, Ankit. So coming to your uh, first question, see, Australia, the ban has taken place, uh, and the reasons what they have outlined is relatively different, uh, and not we don't necessarily agree with what has been uh, said in the Australian ban. When coming to the U.S., the, the state of California has already passed the regulation as to how the products with silica have to be fabricated and handled by the fabricated at their shops. So basically, the regulator in the U.S., uh, specific to the state of California, wants the engineering controls and the fabrication controls to be implemented by the fabricator at the workplace, which includes like doing a wet cutting or uh, putting, the, putting the material under water, submerged under the water and cutting it so that the crystalline silica uh, does not get uh, into the atmosphere and then uh, back into the lungs. And also, also you are supposed to wear the uh, PP and subject employees to regular conditions and do the air monitoring in the workshop. So we don't, to the best of our knowledge and abilities, uh, what we have currently in, of this situation, we don't see that U.S. would be going in the path of Australia because uh, the problem is not with the product. The problem is the way it is processed at certain shops. So I'm not saying that all the fabricators don't uh, process it right, but there are certain fabricators who are still using the rudimentary techniques to fabricate it. If you are fabricating the product under the wet conditions and have the right engineering controls and the PPE and the health conditions being monitored regularly, we don't see any challenges. Because uh, quartz is not the only product which has crystalline silica. Crystalline silica is there even in natural stone. It's even there in certain uh, engineered surfaces like porcelain. It is there in concrete uh, worktops. So by taking a stringent action against a particular product that uh, does not solve the problem. The, the problem has to be addressed at the fabrication level. That is where California has taken a right approach and they have gone about enforcing the occupational health and safety hazard rules for fabrication shops. So that's my... <clears throat> take on your first question. Now coming to your second question on Red Sea, definitely yes. Red Sea has uh, not only caused uh, some chaos in the marketplace, it has also caused some uh, incremental cost for both customers and also for inbound logistics for us, like we import a lot of material from uh, Europe for raw material consumables and other stuff. So all the freight costs have gone up the transit times have gone up and because this was relatively sudden when it started it also created some uh, mismatch so certain things had to be airlifted instead of coming onto the water and then the customers also are saying that the calls have almost doubled so they may they are, some of them are delaying the shipments to see that the situation uh, when it normalizes that they can uh, come back to the normal levels so we also, based on uh, the understanding we have of the industry and with uh, the discussions we have with the liners and the forwarders, believe that the Red Sea situation may not really be a long situation and we expect that uh, next two to three months, this situation to normalize. 
Okay. Thank you. That's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sonal Singh Kohli from Bowhead Investments. Please go ahead. Sir, my uh, question has already been answered. Thank you. Thank you. We we'll move to the next question. The next question is from the line of Shikhar Mundra from Vivo Commercial Limited. Please go ahead. Uh, I want to understand about the demand scenario. How is it looking now, uh, right now? Uh, do you see a you know a revival in demand in the U.S. market? Hello. Hello. Uh, members of the management, can you hear us? Hello. Yes, sir. We can hear you now. Do you have any other questions, Shikhar, or uh, that, that's the only question you have on the demand? Oh, Plus, I want to understand about the Indian markets also. Like, how how do you see our uh, you know our market developing in India? So, okay. And, yeah. Okay. So on the demand scenario, we think that uh, in a quarter or maximum two quarters, we expect the demand to come back. We are just looking optimistically to the uh, U.S. elections getting completed and the demand scenario has also started picking up. As the uh, new home sales are improving, I think as uh, the demand for countertop in those houses come back, things should become normal. So on the demand side of it, we expect in a quarter or another we should be seeing a positive uh, upturn is what is our sense as of now. We see that hospitality industry has definitely picked up as we were predicting in the past because it was lying low for a long time. But recently the activities of refurnishing the uh, hotel rooms or breaking the new grounds, that's picking up well. Uh, coming to, uh, while the other markets continue to be growing decently well for us like Russia, uh, Mexico, Canada and uh, certain markets in Europe are uh, doing good. Now coming to the Indian markets, yes, uh, Indian market is uh, definitely an important market for us, not only being in the backyard and our home country. We are taking certain steps now to uh, increase our presence in the local market and uh, we are tweaking our strategy to go beyond what we were currently doing. We think that next uh, couple of years uh, we'll be having a strong presence in the local market and we're building an experience center also in Hyderabad uh, which can be within the reach of uh, the architects, designers and the retail uh, consumers. And in line with this we'll also have more uh, touch points available across the country either directly or indirectly through our channel partners in uh, medium to long term. So focus for India, the India market is definitely one of our uh, top five markets to focus on and we are uh, allocating increased budgets and the management time on increasing the region of the market. But, uh, but don't you see the pricing can be an issue? Is like is the Indian market uh, ready to you know accept our premium products? Because, uh, the pricing is a perception and uh, if you are good at uh, addressing the perception, you can still get uh, the price you want to give. Now, do you want to chase volumes or do you want to chase value or you want to create a brand equity is a part of a strategy. So while I respect your viewpoint, but I believe that uh, there, is a, there is a way to address all the perceptions and if needed, we are willing to tweak a lot of things in the process. All right, all right. Perfect. Thank you. I'll join the queue back for further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Before we take the next question, a reminder to participants that you may press star and one to join the question queue. The next question is from the line of Shreyan J from Swan Investment. Please go ahead. <coughs> Hello. So my first question is, uh, uh, we were made to understand that a player uh, has shut his plant in uh, Israel and uh, there were some supply issues into the U.S. Uh, so just wanted to understand, have we benefited from that? And uh, just on the QOQ side, uh, you'll be seeing some data. So what is your perception of uh, how have we done QOQ? Because we were expecting slightly better uh, numbers in terms of uh, your sales. Let me first correct you. There is no plant uh, of engineered stone in Switzerland. I think you probably were referring to Israel. Yes. So... Uh, he, he mentioned Israel. I think mean, probably the phone made it out as Switzerland. In any case, I'll come to the point. So... 
the Israel manufacturer who has shut his plant typically operates in a different uh, segment where we operate and uh, they are looking at uh, low cost solutions for their products and which is not the place where we operate. So the, our operations are relative in a different uh, set of customers and categories of pricing. So we have not necessarily benefited from their uh, shutting down the manufacturing facility in the US or Israel, which has been publicly announced. So I don't think uh, anything much has uh, contributed to our success or otherwise because of something happening in Israel. Okay. Uh, and my second question is, sir, uh, what would be our volume uh, growth uh, QOQ or degrowth? So as we have always maintained, we actually do not give operational metrics out. But what I can tell you is that we have a capacity which we can still absorb. And the reason for as uh, uh, while you would have done some factoring of uh, Q on Q growth, but I have always consistently maintained that we are at least a couple of quarters away from seeing uh, a bounce back in the volumes. So how do we counter the bounce back uh, in the volume in the short term was our strategy of introducing new products. That's the reason you see that while the volumes have not significantly grown uh, compared to what has uh, happened in the quarter before, uh, the margins are still intact because we are not chasing growth at the cost of margin yet. And we believe that we are still about a quarter or two away from the volumes to uh, start picking up. Okay. Uh, and so my last question is on uh, uh, the India market. So you mentioned that uh, uh, there are various options uh, that one has to consider. So just wanted to understand what is our strategy? Uh, where do you see Pokerna? Do you uh, want to chase volumes? Do you want to create brand equity? And uh, the other part to this question is, you know, we're seeing uh, houses 30, 35 crores selling uh, in India. So uh, are we looking at, you know, connecting directly uh, with the developers and, uh, you know, getting them on board? H how are you thinking on, those, on, on that part of the business? So we have a go-to-market strategy for India market. So India, of course, uh, if you look at a 35 crores house, what is the cost of a countertop in the kitchen? Maybe 4 or 5 lakh rupees. So not necessarily 35 crores is translating into a crore rupees for a company like us. Because our product has a application which is predominantly a vertical application or a, a horizontal countertop. So uh, it typically addresses that, you know, our share in the high-end dwelling does not necessarily mean that we'll have 20-30% uh, or 10% of what the cost of uh, production for or manufacturing of that uh, construction for that house could be. But having said that, we have done a lot of high-end houses in India. We do several projects, like we've done large uh, banks, U.S. banks, offices in India. We we have done uh, large projects where we've done about hundreds of villas, high-end villas, where a product has been used as a kitchen countertop and the wall claddings. We are uh, also working aggressively to work with uh, certain uh, prestigious developers to bring up product to their projects. Apart from uh, expanding our reach in the uh, domestic market through kitchen and bar dealers and uh, selective uh, uh, retail channels. So we don't want definitely to be a product which is available at every nook and corner because we are uh, working to create uh, a product which is desirable and available with dreams and it's not easily it's a luxurious product it is not an off-the-shelf product like a tile that you go to uh, 100 tile shops and you'll find the same product at 100 tile shops that's not our market uh, strategy so we have a different go-to-market strategy which is largely in line with what do we see the, the established players doing in the Europe and uh, US markets okay thank you so much sir. all the best thank you Thank you. Next question is from the line of Akshada from Vivo Commercial Limited. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hello. Hi. I wanted to understand the product market mix, basically, how American market is doing, but uh, if it is doing better than your other markets, or if there is a specific market which is driving growth and any market which is, you know, taken back. 
So see, basically we are the largest uh, exporter into the U.S. of quartz surfaces, and U.S. continues to be our uh, primary focus. So while uh, there could be a temporary uh, few points here and there in the U.S., but U.S. continues to be our main market. Uh, growth in the other markets like Canada uh, and certain parts of Europe, Mexico is uh, growing quarter on quarter, and we are quite positive about it. And we believe that uh, our presence uh, in the U.S. Uh, with our distributors and our strong relationship with our uh, customers for whom we private label and the new markets what we are tapping will definitely give us uh, good positive growth uh, in the next couple of quarters. Okay. Can you tell me the percent, <coughs> sorry, percentage of revenue that you are currently getting from America? So as I said in the previous calls also, over 90% of our revenue comes from America. Okay. So we were planning to launch some new designs in America, as you mentioned in the last con call as well. Yeah. Uh, where are we on that front? Can you see any visibility of when you can launch the same? We've already launched, and as I covered in my con uh, opening remarks, we continue to launch. So the, the next launch is scheduled in end of this month in Las Vegas at KBIS. So are you, what percentage of our, even if it is in your own internal computations, are you expecting it to uh, add to the margins in a significant way by next year? The new product launch always will add to the margins. Now, how successful the new launch would be, it takes six to nine months for us to figure out. So while what we have done in the past is already reflected, and I hope the same would continue in the future as well. Okay, because in the previous con call you mentioned you're taking it things month on month basis. So I was just wondering if you're seeing a larger future at this point in time. So for next quarter or two, I continue to have the same view what I've had in the past. But I have uh, a very strong view that uh, in after a quarter or two, the the forecast or the visibility would be relatively longer term. Okay. And my last question was on the KPEX uh, and the Euro plant. Where are we on that front? Is it done and should we uh, see results in next quarter or so as we predicted before? I don't think we predicted uh, the, the results to come in uh, next quarter or so. The shipments are under, uh, uh, are already on water and certain would be leaving it. So we expect that uh, Q3 FY25 or Q4 FY25 is when both are uh, capexes of two different technologies to commercialize. So we have to start uh, installation of the machines and then the hot run, cold runs have to get completed. The R&D has to get completed. So I think uh, I would say that uh, uh, probably last quarter of FI25 is when we'll have a very larger visibility to give you as to when will the revenue start flowing from that capex. Okay, okay. And last quarter, you also mentioned about the U.S. Bass Association, uh, that you were expecting a 12 to 18 months lag period. Uh, do you have any update on this front? I'm sorry, I could not follow what you said. Can you please come back? Hello? Yeah, please go ahead. Your question was uh, not clear to me. Can you rephrase it? You mentioned about U.S. Bass Association in the last quarter. Right, but there, uh, you were expecting the second half to be better with a, because there is typically a 12 to 18 month lag with the home improvement front of U.S. Bath Association. I think you are referring to National Kitchen and Bath Association of U.S. Yes, 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 that's right. So basically, so a house typically gets completed between 12 to 18 months period. That cycle cannot be contracted just because... Uh, the market has started picking up because there is a construction process and the way that you start putting foundations and the roofing comes and the interior come and countertop is one of the last members to uh, enter the house. So I believe that the period of 12 to 18 months when the uh, house starts getting constructed, constructed, that's when the demand for the countertop would come. So I don't know what the question is, but that was the context in which I made the comment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Rishikesh Bhagat from Kotak Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. On your com Hello. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity morning. So just on your comments uh, about potential improvement of visibility six months down the line or nine months down the line. Now, 
if i look at it say going forward uh, if is there any scope for us in the sense you also mentioned that we have fair bit of capacity also so fair to assume that the operating leverage benefit is yet to kick in uh, if assuming the demand scenario betters from here on and so to that extent probably margins there's a reasonable scope for margins also to improve from here on. So, Rishikesh, uh, if you uh, pay attention to the comment I mentioned, while technically what you said that uh, operating leverage would kick in as the volume uh, goes up, yes, if we are able to add more of uh, the mid to high end design which we recently launched and they get, uh, which is already in the market and they start picking up, then the additional uh, operating leverage would come up. But if you look at one of the comments which I made that uh, we are also working on diligently optimizing our capacity utilization to resonate more closely with the market demand and our strategy growth ambitions. So in the short term, it could slightly compress our margin, but we believe that that compression could actually open up more doors because we may add some new customers where we'll be able to push in all these mid to high end products. So once this uh, mix of uh, capacity utilization with other new customers getting on board and the new designs picking up, once this uh, mix gets stabilized, the operating leverage will definitely peak out uh, from what you have seen in the latest, latest peaks. Okay. Okay. The second question is uh, just related to this regulatory headwinds or probably related to safety, health safety and health regulation. Now, specific to U.S. market, is it going to be a state specific or do you think what happened in California, what has passed, it will get uh, in the sense replicated in other states or do you think it will be a state specific regulation? See, America is a different type of a country. So predicting what they do is a type of doing crystal uh, gazing, but with our experience and understanding, Usually, the uh, certain regulations are at the state level and certain regulations are at the federal level. So, what California has done is actually a good thing and we would uh, definitely want it to be uh, replicated in different parts of the U.S., whether through a state initiative or a federal initiative, because that is making sure that the fabricating uh, workshops are actually following the OSHA guidelines. So I don't think it, it really impacts any anybody in the industry uh, as a manufacturer as long as the OSHA regulations are complied by the fabricators. It, it is not a negative. California regulations are actually regulating the fabricators and the... Uh, not the manufacturer. No, I got. So I'm not saying it's negative. I believe it's definitely uh, on, in a good direction, a great direction. Just the perspective here is that: Do you feel that are any other states uh, pushing for much stringent regulation in lines with Australian? That's why where the question was. Usually, what we have seen with our uh, experience in uh, US and also what has happened to other. The, the toughest state is California, and they have already started the process, and they are going in the right direction. So whether it was P65 warning to you, you pick up anything you buy in California, you will see a warning behind it, because they have already taken us. Uh, not only our product, even if you buy a toothpaste, you may probably end up seeing a P65 warning, or if you buy a phone also, you may see. So California has got a very stringent regulations in the way they look at things. So I think the toughest state has taken a right position, and we believe that other states would uh, do the same. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pritesh Chinda from Lucky Investment. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry to ask this again. I missed what is the update now on that uh, uh, changes in Australia with respect to the product? So basically, engineered stone in Australia has been banned. So if it is an engineered stone which has got crystalline silica, then the product is not supposed to be fabricated in Australia. Of course, you can cut it in India and install it without creating any dust in Australia because product, when it is installed, does not emit any uh, gases for that matter and does not give out any uh, crystalline silica. That's the update on the Australia side of it. Coming to the California side of it, the regulators have passed a regulation that the fabricating shops have to process all the materials, whether not only quartz countertop, but also 
natural stone countertops, porcelain, quartz, everything which has got uh, silica in it to be processed, crystalline silica in it to be processed in a particular way like doing a wet cutting or submerged cutting and uh, monitoring the air quality, ensuring that the employees are wearing the personal protective equipment. All those things have been uh, passed in uh, California. So now in Australia, the market is fed with uh, cut products all over the world going into Australia, uh, or the engineered stone sales itself have uh, you know declined. We don't actually sell to Australia, so I'm not ready. We have a complete picture of what's happening there. But what I can tell you is that uh, there are different substitutes available in the market, which may be taking it. Or maybe people in the line in future may start taking the fabricated products. So I could comp- currently do not have more visibility of what's cooking up in Australia. Okay. And my last question is with respect to for us in terms of capacity utilization improvements, you're mentioning that all these new designs that you've put up and whatever is the market status uh, in terms of demand, you see things changing after a couple of quarters. That's what you have mentioned, right? Yeah. So I believe that demand uptake probably would come in later Q3 of the calendar. So that's what our assessment is, and that's in line with whatever we've had some discussions with our customers, and also with the U.S. election getting passed by by the time, and little stability coming to the market. And I assume that uh, the Fed rate as they have been paused, will also continue to pause for some more time and then the housing market starts picking up and whatever uptick has happened in last uh, quarter or so would also start giving out more visibility for the market players and then also the uh, inventory stabilization would have largely been completed which was happening and this Red Sea situation would also be behind all that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from Anuj Sharma from M3 Investment. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Few questions. One is uh, in terms of uh, machine technologies apart from Britain, are there other Chinese competing technologies or other technologies which are producing as good as a quality as uh, the ones Britain's are? Just how how is that uh, shaping up in terms of technology? Hello. Yeah, so coming to your question, see, basically Breton was the original inventor and the holder of this technology of producing Breton stone, also called as engineered stone of quartz surfaces. So over a period of uh, time, certain Chinese have copied the technology and created some replica. Uh, based on our understanding and our belief, we believe that Breton is the best in the sector and the innovation and research, what they are bringing to the table because what Chinese are copying is something which was developed by Breton maybe five, ten years back. But what Breton is now doing uh, probably is uh, relatively new and uh, different. And uh, the way the product comes out completely as a fully manufactured uh, one, we believe that the product is uh, differentiated with the way it is processed, the way it is uh, cured, the way it is polished is substantially different from what would a, a typical non breton factory would do it. So there are people who understand the difference between a Breton factory material and a non breton factory material. But then there is also a sect of people who believe that material is material and there is no differentiation in the technology. But we continue to have a strong belief that Britain is differentiated from the non breton Sure. That's, that's helpful. Uh, my second question is in terms of supply from Britain. I think it, it's also uh, expanding its uh, uh, output or machines to many other suppliers. So how is the supply from Britain uh, machines uh, increasing over the next uh, one to three years? Some some outlook there. Britain will continue to sell the machines to whoever is able to pay them. So while that does not mean that it is off the shelf technology or ready to buy a product so typically a breton product can take a breton plant can take anywhere between 15 to 24 months before it is commercialized and we have not seen a, any reduction in that timeline so i don't know how many plants they have sold in which part of the world because that's not uh, 
our business. But what I can tell you that there, we have not seen any reduction in the lead time for a bed and plant to be commercialized. All right, all right. And my, and my third question is, you know, one part is the one part is the machine. The the second part is the design. Now these designs are these institutionalized or are these purely a function of people who work in the organization? I mean, uh, can there be a chance that you know, a competitor pulls over a few of these people and he is able to replicate those those designs, or is it more institutionalized than that? The ability to create newer newer designs. Some some thoughts there. Yeah, hey, I think the copycats will exist everywhere. People may come, people may go. So that does not deter us because. This is not something which is new. So your ability to think differently, I think we are blessed to be humans and humans can think always differently. So uh, while some people may come, some people may go, but the thought process, uh, the flair for design is in our DNA and it's not just in the DNA of one or two person, it is in the DNA of every team member. So I don't think uh, people moving or competitor doing some unethical practices to get hold of certain designs or certain people in a illegal way would create any uh, long-term debtor. There could be a short-term uh, nuisance, but we know how to handle that legally, and uh, we are also working on our intellectual property protection in the long term. Thank you. Next question is from Harshil Chetia from Ladder Up Wealth. Please go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity. Can just help us with uh, you know what is the capacity for quartz surfaces as well as granite and what is the utilization level currently? I think your voice was breaking, so can you please come back? Uh, I just wanted to know what is the capacity for quartz as well as granite and what is the capacity utilization currently? So I think I can tell you uh, partly of it. Our capacity is close to 20 million square foot in quartz. And we have uh, capacity which can be utilized further on the quartz side of it because uh, the markets have been a little tepid for some time. And uh, in a quarter or two, we believe that markets will bounce back and we'll be able to come uh, probably to a better uh, capacity utilization. On the granite, I think the numbers are self explanatory and there's a good amount of capacity to be utilized. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Amir Chedda from Bandian Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, first, if you could uh, throw some uh, more color uh, on the competition that we are facing in the U.S., uh, you know, which are the major countries we are facing competition uh, from? So basically, in the U.S., uh, our business model is... Uh, Two pronged. One is that we have our own distributors who sell under Quantra brand in certain states, but not across the, uh, the U.S., but certain specific locations in certain specific states. And then we have our uh, uh, customers who are large brands in the U.S. with locations almost spread throughout the U.S. for whom we private label the product. So when we do a private labeling of the product, we typically are not competing with uh, any of these brands because they are actually our, our customers. But they would be competing with all the big boys of the industry who may be manufacturing their product in America themselves uh, or bringing the product from Europe or certain parts of Asia. So when it comes to Quantra as a brand, which is uh, where we go, as, we compete with a uh, lot of uh, local brands of the U.S. who are bringing in the product again from Asia or Europe or uh, uh, within the U.S. itself. To name a few, like all the big boys, you name it like Silestone, we compete with them. Uh, we compete with uh, uh, certain other players uh, coming out of uh, Europe. Our competition is, we don't consider our friends from Southeast Asia or from India as a competitor because their products are on a different footing, footing compared to our products. So while they may be value engineering us, saying that, okay, this is from Quantra, we, I have a substitute available from my portfolio that could be relatively price low. So we are not actually chasing those type of uh, customers because our customers are largely 
in the mid to higher end uh, service thing but there is a large market at the bottom of the pyramid that is something which we are not uh, chasing because it's the bottom that's put out there okay and has this competition increased in, in the last couple of quarters uh, or maybe the last two or three years yeah because i think uh, i believe there is uh, definitely uh, an excess capacity which has been built up in india so people don't know what to do and how to sell the product so they go around uh, selling their product uh, without understanding what the market needs or what the market uh, demands and uh, when they have a lack of understanding of the approach towards the market that's when they create certain uh, i don't know how to put it but a play field which is relatively uh, confusing for some but we have been used to all this type of things because even before we were uh, when we were competing with uh, south east asian countries or uh, european countries the, there were certain players who were uh, working on a different type of uh, marketing strategy but we could uh, effectively handle them with our own uh, strategies of going to the market with a unique product stronger relationships standing with the product uh, and being unique completely so basically we are trying to ring fence our competition and trying to create a blue ocean type of a strategy rather than being on a red ocean side of it thank you we'll take that as the last question i would now like to hand the conference back to the management team for closing comments thank you so much everyone i look forward to catching up again on the year end numbers have a great day thank you so much thank you very much on behalf of poker limited that concludes the conference thank you for joining us ladies and gentlemen you may now disconnect your lines